And now, please welcome disability rights advocate, Tanzila Khan. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm Tanzila Khan, I am from Pakistan, and I am an entrepreneur, I'm a writer, I'm a public speaker, and I'm also a filmmaker. I think I've kept myself really busy. And my work has taken me across the globe. I have been to so many countries. I've met the most amazing people. I'm Pakistani, so we love food, and I've had the best food in the world. And of course, always finding that sweet spot between accessibility and adventure, the world has obliged. But as all this amazing work was happening across the world, I realized that I was also developing a parallel skill set of traveling. You know, when you have a disability, you need to have a special skill set to travel with that. You need to correspond differently with all the actors in the ecosystem. For example, with the airlines, you have to talk to them about what your needs are, you have to go back and forth on emails, you have to talk to them about the seat, about the folding of the wheelchair, about the battery, about your arrival times, exit. With the hotels, you have to talk about the room, you have to talk about uh, everything, about the needs of your phys physical uh, state their definition of accessibility could be really different from yours. For example, they'll be like, yes, yes, come on, we're accessible. Turns out when you go there, they were talking about the elevator and not the bathroom in the room. What do you do with that? And then also cracking visa applications. Sometimes, especially in my country, in Pakistan, the consulates and embassies themselves are not wheelchair accessible. And the entire process could be so cumbersome for an able-bodied person what to talk of someone with a disability. But there are others like me, and I realized that I was able to crack through this. And for us to actually thrive in this ecosystem together, I felt that we just don't have to survive. We need to thrive. And for that, we need to think like a community. Now, I have so many stories to tell you all, but I think let's start from where we are, Dubai. How do we go back? So in 2017, I was here in Russell Khaimah. I was here for a conference. And what you do in Dubai, in UAE, when you're not working, you go to the beach, right? So I decided to go to the beach during breaks. Now you see this picture on the right. It's a very serene, nice picture. What you don't see is the kiosk behind it. So at least four to seven people got me on that beach. That beach was not at all accessible to me because of the sand and because of my wheels. But here, there were people who were carrying me, dragging me, pushing me, making that happen for me. And then one of them took the picture. Of course, we had to document all our effort. And then they all brought me back. And then one of them picked up a pipe and started washing my wheels. And while that was happening, I was thinking to myself, this experience was definitely not accessible to me. But here I was experiencing the beach, and I've been brought back safely. How? How did this happen? Because of the people, because of the community. So this is where we need to understand that where the system does not cater, the community steps in. And let's never ever underestimate the power of that. That kind of inspired me. And I felt that, uh, why not take things one step forward? So prior to everything, I was, I was traveling for conferences and consultancies. My mother used to be my companion, and she was a great partner. You see, every time I was up on stage talking and doing my work, she'll be out there shopping for me. So by the time I would go to my room, I'd have new clothes, and I really miss her. But now I felt that it was time to take one step forward and test out this empathy out in the world. So I decided to take my first ever solo trip totally by myself. And now I was going to transition from relying on family to relying on community. At the peak of lockdown in 2021, I took my first trip to Istanbul, Turkey. My miles were expiring, and I thought that was a sign from God. I thought I had it sorted, the airlines, the hotels, I thought I was a pro, until I realized I had come face to face with a situation I wasn't ready for. That was dealing with the taxi drivers. And I felt that in this ecosystem, travel is actually like an organism. 
And the taxi drivers, the Ubers, all these people who help us commute are like the veins and arteries. When I met with some of them in Turkey, some of them had no idea on how to deal with a passenger with a disability. So here I was, like a beneficiary, and also their first ever trainer. I gave them instructions on how to speak, how to talk, even if there was a language barrier. I was helping them help me fold my wheelchair. I was picking up the battery myself. I was telling them what's it like to be independent with a disability. Some of them would get a little edgy and would be like, uh, it's too heavy. So before that, I would crack a little joke. I'd be like, do you go to the gym? And they're like, no. And I said, you should have for this day. <laughs> Some of them would be so excited and they'll be all jumpy and chirpy and they'll be like, what do we do? I'm like, calm down, we got this. And I loved how they were enthusiastic about getting me to my journey in the most inclusive way possible. This was community, this was pure empathy that I was relying on. Imagine if we integrate all of that systematically into the world of travel as we're stepping forward into the future of travel. But my story does not end over there. It was time to go one step further. When I came back from Istanbul, Turkey, two of my friends, Afsha and Zirguna from Pakistan, both of them have a disability as well, they contacted me and they said, Tanzila, I think we should travel together. I said, I thought you'll never ask. So we did a lot of back and forth Zoom calls because all three of us are from different provinces in Pakistan. And first we decided to go to Maldives. But we found out through our research that Maldives was not accessible. One, it's all island and beaches and I had learned my lesson. Secondly, to commute from the airport to one of these islands, you either have to take the seaplane or you have to take one of the boats, which was not accessible as per our research. So Maldives closed the doors on us, but Egypt opened the doors. So through a certain process, all three of us reached Egypt and we had the time of our lives. In fact, we made headlines in our own country. We were covered by BBC, we got our own merchandise. Come collect one of these from me for your laptops. And we were having a great time, but we still faced challenges. For example, we had to book two Ubers instead of one, one for our wheelchairs, one for ourselves. When we went to the hotel, they upgraded us to an accessible room, but they made us pay for it. And here we argued with them that, look, if we were able-bodied women, we would have taken a regular room. The difference, I like to call it the disability tax. And we as leaders must mitigate that into the future that we're stepping in because we end up spending much more than what an able-bodied regular person would pay for a service. And we want to enjoy the same benefit and have the best service. One particular incident that happened in, in Cairo, we had, we had bought tours from a Pakistani company, and part of that tour was taking us to a restaurant. The restaurant was great, and then what do you do? You go to the bathroom, right? At that time, we figured that the bathroom for the women was actually on the first floor and the bathroom for men was on the ground floor. When you gotta go, you gotta go, right? So the first thing we did, we had to vacate the men's bathroom, which was in itself a very daunting process. But once that was done, one by one, we were using the bathroom. And when my friend Afshan went inside, I heard this loud noise, dadam. And I'm like, hey, are you okay? And she says, I love the way we like to humor ourselves especially in times of adversity, with the courage that we have. And she says, which roughly translates to, I fell down a little bit. I said, should I come? She said, no. And I immediately understood that she's in a vulnerable position and she does not want me to see her that way. I figured it out. She comes out, we smile, we laugh. To this date, we still laugh about this incident. But I know the story behind the smile. I know she was in pain, but she couldn't say anything. We did not have the comfort with our organizers to get any help. Sitting there, I thought to myself, all of this could have been avoided. One, if there was a wheelchair accessible bathroom, or if the information of inaccessibility was communicated to us, we would have changed our plans. We would have taken our money elsewhere. We would have opted for a more accessible option. And that is what we all need to understand. The next important thing is communication. I think the journey towards accessibility actually starts from talking about the inaccessibility. And sometimes that leads to better accessible options. So we came back and we built a case around that. 
But like I keep saying, the journey does not have to stop at all. Last year, I went to Sweden to pursue my master's degree, and I took full advantage of my residence permit. I did not bunk any classes, I promise. Every time I would get a chance, I would pick my rucksack, the one that you see over there. I came to Dubai with the same one, and I would go to any European country available. But this time, I was being a bit more strategic. I was documenting my journey, I was mapping the accessibility, I was blogging, I was making videos, I was talking to the local people, collecting stories, I was also emailing the local municipalities to know about their attitude towards disability and inclusion, and the world was responding full on. I love the potential that we have, and I love the fact that I'm here today to, uh, to make you all aware of it, that we have a huge opportunity that we can tap into. One quick story is about this guy, Christian over here, that's was having a thumbs up with me. Train journeys are lovely, right? Especially in Europe. So I decided to get on one. I remember when I was going from Uppsala to Stockholm, I was off-boarded because that train was not accessible. So I immediately tried to get on another one. When I was getting, this gentleman helped me. And we striked a conversation. He was from Rwanda. I've been to Rwanda, so we had a lot to share about it. And I remember we exchanged numbers and I said, when I come back from Gothenburg, we must meet for coffee. Then I reached Stockholm and I was off-boarded again from two more trains because they had no idea, they had no information about the accessibility available. So we had to wait for the train to arrive to know if they have a ramp service that would be suitable for a regular wheelchair. And there I was sitting all by myself at night at Stockholm Central Station thinking, what do I do now? I had to take a flight because I was losing money. I had made all the bookings and I had started to get a little sad about it. So I called Christian. He actually worked for Ryanair. When I was booking my flight, I found out that within 24 hours, you cannot book access to accessibility to get support for your wheelchair for the airline. Now you see, they do have assistance available, but that was not helping me in that situation. So I call him and I say, are you coming tomorrow? Do you have a shift? And he says, I don't. I'm actually coming to see my friend, though. I tell him the situation. He comes tomorrow. He receives me. He makes sure that I receive the assistance I need. He books it for me. He takes me all the way to the aircraft. And I was able to make my trip. And that trip was a fantastic trip. I later wrote an article about it that circulated on LinkedIn and reached his boss. And he calls me and says, you've made me famous. I said, that's what I do. I make the good guys famous. You are a hero without a cape. And we need more like you. People who have quick thinking, people who throw away the rule book, they go beyond the protocol. You see, accessibility is very, very nuanced. We need quick leadership. We need inclusive leadership to, to help us thrive in this world as well and reach our destinations. Sometimes, people with disabilities, when they travel by themselves, they feel like a ghost. You can look through us, you can be spooked by them, you can be curious about them, you want to know their story. But every experience, every gesture, every act made towards us makes a difference, and it contributes to our journey. But the best thing you can do is sometimes look at the world from their perspective.
I wonder, I wonder if you all are spooked by me, curious, what? Let's find out during coffee break. But my message today is loud and clear. We must think like a community. We must communicate and talk about disability because the opportunity is massive. We're talking about more than one billion people across the world. But let's not just do it for them. Let's do it for us. Because one day, may Allah give us all a very long life, we might reach a stage where we might lose our own abilities. But who wants to stay at home? So we have to pick up our rucksack and we have to start traveling. But before that, I have a very important question for all of you. When can me and my friends visit you and celebrate you? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanzila. That was very, very powerful. I'm, I'm so glad you were able to come. I'm so glad you're able to share this message with the travel industry. And as you said, at some point, I think all of us will have some sort of disability at, because of age. And I think one of, the, one of the things that the travel industry misses, it feels like from, from our understanding, is that uh, people are just living longer, which means that at some point people, uh, but they want to continue traveling. And people who are, um, have disabilities may not be younger or old, they, they may be older. So that's why the industry needs, it's a giant, giant market that the travel industry has to be aware of. Um, what's your experience been so far of Dubai and, 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 and the progress they need to make? I'm very hopeful about the future. And I think I've come so far all the way to this stage because of the empathy and because of the kindness of people out there. But there's always room for development. And I'm excited for it. And I want to inspire everybody over here to think in that direction. And can we please have a big round of applause for Rafat and his entire team because they are one of the catalysts of making sure that we have inclusive experiences. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. And for us, obviously, we cover it not just as a business, but the whole point is, and we, we've said this from the start, um, we, we think travelers first and how that affects the travel industry. And in many cases, um, rights activists like you, travelers like you are changing the travel industry. So I hope there's change. I hope there's a lot more awareness. And I hope we do it with empathy as well as community as well. So, Inshallah, inshallah. we will. Inshallah. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you very you much, folks. everyone. Have a great conference. Thank you.